Next, neuroimaging. Neuroimaging is the process of capturing or converting the intrinsic properties and processes of the brain into externalized images that represent its internal structure and function. Modern neuroimaging is a fascinating evolving product of science, technology and medicine. Various two- and three-dimensional images can be generated by exploiting the differentiating features such as tissue density, calcium content, water content, blood flow, heme oxygenation or redox states and so on, as well as passive or actively induced electromagnetic activity. In addition, radioactive markers or metabolic substrates, dyes and other contrast agents may be administered to enhance image resolution and to assist in making better distinctions between the various structures and their functions. Each of the imaging techniques has its own limitations and risks, however. For the most part, overt brain disease and injuries can be identified using these modalities. But the same is not the case for many mental disorders at present. Functional imaging techniques are continuing to improve, however, and various mental disorders are now becoming more recognizable. It remains an open question, however, whether any changes observed in functional image patterns also represent a clinically significant improvement in function. Nevertheless, given all these limitations, neuroimaging offers invaluable insights on the brain. It has also actually provided some of the strongest support for the clinical and scientific validity of dissociative disorders. Before reviewing the various imaging modalities, and what they have to offer in dissociative disorders, they must first be understood within the broader context of assessment modalities in general. Only then can their contribution to understanding these conditions be fully appreciated and the limitations on how the data should be interpreted be properly understood. The first step in diagnosing any abnormal condition is realizing something is not normal. As humans, there's a natural proclivity for differentiating the ordinary from the extraordinary. And the natural response to something extraordinary is a combination of curiosity and fear in varying proportions. The discovery of something abnormal in another individual is often accidental and usually informal in the initial stages. For example, a parent noticing a child acting strangely, or friends and co-workers noticing someone is a little off. This may be the first step. With milder forms of mental disorders, particularly those where insight is preserved, it may often be the patient who identifies a problem or finds the distress intolerable. This represents the so-called awareness stage, and then, depending on where and how the individual accesses the healthcare systems that are available, there may be a variety of diagnostic screening tests to establish the probability through a process of elimination or confirmation for a range of diagnoses and also to rule out important or life-threatening possibilities. In clinical medicine, these might include blood pressure assessment, blood glucose measurement, urine drug screening, and so on. These tests are designed to be sensitive, which means they are unlikely to miss an important abnormality, but they're not necessarily specific. For example, a pregnancy test could be positive due to an ovarian cancer, not only due to a pregnancy so it's not specific to the extent that it does not distinguish the one from the other. Therefore, once a suitably sensitive screening test has detected an abnormal finding, a more specific test must be used to confirm the suspected condition or to explore alternative explanations. These tests are usually called clinical assessments because they are done within the context of a healthcare visit and they also employ collection and measurement techniques that are generally not available, appropriate or reliable when employed by untrained persons. The focus in a clinical assessment is to obtain as much relevant information as possible using basic human interactions and our physical senses, even if these are refined or extended by means of structured psychiatric interviews or a diagnostic device like a stethoscope. Based on what is found or excluded, a narrower range of possibilities is then subject to a selection of appropriate specialized tests based on their ability to detect that which is undetectable or inestimable by means of our physical senses, such as the presence of a tumor in the brain 
or the concentration of mercury in a blood sample. And it is here where neuroimaging comes in. It follows in the progressive series of assessments, each of which is designed to narrow down the diagnostic possibilities so that only the minimum number of unanswered questions need confirmation by means of these special examinations. The reason for this process is to reduce unnecessary costs, but also to avoid unhelpful wild goose chases, which often follow the discovery of an unrelated or incidental finding on special assessments. Having said that, there is of course a valid place for special examinations early on if a life-threatening condition must be ruled out, or if the window of opportunity for intervention is very short, such as for a stroke, brain hemorrhage or heart attack. In mental disorders, the role of structural neuroimaging is far less clearly defined, however, other than for the purpose of ruling out a suspected brain disease. However, functional neuroimaging has become increasingly helpful in demonstrating, for example, that some patients suspected of malingering or having fictitious disorders were indeed not. Neuroimaging has offered evidence supporting certain anomalous and even bizarre presentations in dissociative disorder patients and we will look at some examples of these later on. Images are powerful. And just as we described in the case of diagnostic labels, images can very easily take on the impression of reality that they were never intended to represent, nor able to offer. Like the people who invented, and the machines that produce them, they all have limitations. Which brings us to the concept called scientific models. One of the roles of science is to create workable abstractions, or more plainly said, calculated guesses, which we call scientific models. The purpose of models is to simplify something that is very complex so that we are better able to describe, or explain, or work with it in a given situation. In language we may use metaphors, analogies, or parables to offer a mental bridge, or substitute to facilitate understanding of a complex concept. In science, jargon and pictures fulfill the same role. However, it's important to realize that all models are just that, models. They are not true or full-scale equivalents and therefore by necessity they omit important details in favor of emphasizing others. A cartoon is not a photograph and workable is not actual. Let me illustrate. Giving something a name is one of the most fundamental and oldest forms of modeling. It reduces something or even someone very complex into a word or two and such words have great impact. Take our personal names as an example. In social settings we deliberately deny unwanted persons access to our names to avoid the measure of control this affords them. And unfortunately in the same way a name, diagnostic label or brain scan may come to represent far more than it actually is. So some of the dangers of modeling include oversimplification, restriction of thinking and often intellectual arrogance. This is especially true whenever models or images are employed to represent interpersonal or in the case of neuroimaging intrapersonal dynamics. They tend to shift the focus away from the relational towards the remedial. In other words, what needs to be fixed rather than what needs to be understood. Our understanding also becomes preoccupied with the mechanisms involved, whilst failing to appreciate the meaning or purpose of what is happening, how it works or does not, rather than what this signifies. If that's all too abstract, let me illustrate these differing perspectives between mechanism, meaning and purpose by using an example of you reading a book. The mechanism of reading, as we understand it, is that light reflected off the pages of the book goes through the eyes, into the brain, and you then interpret what you see. That's the mechanism. But that is not what you experience when you read. Instead, you experience reading the book in front of you. So which is valid? Is it the mechanism or the experience of reading? Is it the process in your head? or the meaningful experience of the book in front of you that matters most? Well, obviously both are valid, and they are also interrelated, but they are not the same. 
If you had no eyes, you couldn't read, obviously. But seeing eyes do not prescribe the experience of what is read either. They only make it possible for you to read. And then on top of that, there's also the purpose of reading. Why do you read? This is not only about the mechanism or even the transient experience of reading. It's also about the impact the material has on you in terms of advancing your education and personal growth. So the purpose is yet another additional level of understanding. So what is the point here? Well, before showing you the results of some of the DID research, particularly studies using brain scans and electromagnetic tracing of brain signals, we need to make sure that it's clear what the findings represent. It is very tempting to look at brain scans and assume that this represents the full picture of reality. It obviously does not. So to help you to see the limitations more clearly, I'd like to use the following video clip to illustrate this. If you look at this video clip, what is missing? Well, there's obviously no music score, no pianist. But still, the keys are moving, and that's what you're seeing. So what am I trying to show you? Well, the point is that seeing moving keys does not mean that you are also seeing either the pianist or the composer of the music. The keys are just the keys. They're the mechanism of expression. So let me now take it one step further into neurophysiology. This is a study which shows that by electrically stimulating specific parts of your brain, I can actually make you smile, involuntarily. This individual is being made to smile by electrically stimulating a part of the brain that is responsible for smiling. So yes, artificial electrical stimulation of these specific parts of the brain would make you smile and may even make you experience a sense of mirth or humor. But does this mean, if I can use a 9-volt battery or electrical stimulator to get your brain to make you smile, that that is exactly the same as when you laugh at my humor? Am I armed with an electrode, the natural, legitimate player of this hardware of your brain? My sense is that you would all be inclined to answer no, and I agree. In fact, I would even say, using the analogy of the piano in the video clip, that I have then taken over your piano using electricity. I've now become the invisible pianist of your brain, pushing the keys on your behalf. So why am I telling you all this? Well, there are two main reasons. Firstly, our brains develop and mature in such a way that certain parts of the brain support specialized functioning, including patterns of thought, perceptions, feelings, or behavior. Just like in the case of a piano, there are conditioned keys that produce distinct sounds, and it is normal to have these keys. On the brain scans, I will show you how these keys are being played or activated. However, seeing the activation of a particular set of keys does not explain exactly how or why they are being activated, or even who or what is activating them. All you can see is the moving keys. So that's the first point. Just like in the video of the piano, you are only seeing the keys, not the pianist or the composer. In fact, there can potentially be more than one pianist playing the keys, which is what neuroimaging in DID seems to suggest, as you will see shortly. The second point is this. If DID individuals tell you that, as children, they were subjected to electrical brain stimulation or electrical torture, don't dismiss it. Take it seriously. An imposter can program or damage the keys so that they don't play as they should or they may play what they shouldn't. This is, very basically speaking, what so-called conditioning, programming and mind control are about. Broadly speaking, there are two types of neuroimaging, structural and functional. Structural neuroimaging focuses on anatomical features and physical structures and their integrity, composition or shape. They also look at the physical features of disease and damage, such as tumors, brain degeneration, hemorrhage and trauma. Functional imaging, on the other hand, looks at dynamic and interactive aspects such as blood flow, metabolism, fluid shifts, 
chemical composition and electromagnetic features. Sometimes the same technology can employ to achieve both of these objectives to a greater or lesser extent. And this is the case with magnetic resonance imaging or MRI in particular. Another important variable is the time frame in which the images are captured. Some assessments capture an instant in time. Others represent a specific window of time, whereas yet others can provide ongoing monitoring over time. Here is a list of typical neuroimaging techniques. On the structural side there is computed tomography, also called computerized axial tomography or CAT scanning, which is two-dimensional X-ray cross-sectioning. There is magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, plain X-ray or radiography, and a technique that is rarely used today called pneumoencephalography, where air is used as a contrast agent to outline the brain. On the functional side, there is functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, which is able to manipulate the magnetic signature of MRIs in a way that relative blood flow can be determined to see which parts of the brain are presumed to be active and based on the changes in blood supply to those areas. Then there are two nuclear imaging techniques, positron emission tomography, or PET, and single photon emission computer tomography, or SPECT. The difference between the two is essentially that PET uses, typically, radioactive glucose and thereby determines more directly where there is greater metabolic activity as a function of the use of the glucose. SPECT, on the other hand, makes use of a radioactive tracer that distributes to functioning living cells but not necessarily in as direct proportion to their levels of activity. There's also magnetic resonance spectroscopy which uses the magnetic signature of chemical compounds to determine their concentration in various parts of the brain, such as neurotransmitters. And there's diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, that identifies the unique directional movement of water molecules and is able to show the physical connections between nerves in the brain, for instance. And lastly, there's brain electrical activity mapping, or BEAM, which is the same as the so-called quantitative electroencephalogram, or QEEG, which measures the distribution and origin of electromagnetic signals within the brain. I'll only provide a brief introduction to some of these technologies to show you how they've been applied in the study of dissociative disorders, as well as some other experimental and clinical applications that provide additional insight in these conditions. Because of its unique relevance in this field and the relative lack of familiarity with the more advanced configurations of this technology, I'd like to start with brain electrical activity mapping and its predecessor, the electroencephalogram. Hans Berger was the first scientist to actually measure electrical activity in the brain. And modern EEG is now a non-invasive record of cortical electrical activity of the brain. It measures voltage fluctuations through the scalp at multiple sites as a result of movement of ions over the cell wall of brain cells. It has been used most extensively to assess the presence of abnormal, spontaneous electrical activity in the brain as an indication of seizure disorders or epilepsy. The latter has also been its main application until relatively recently. Access to computer processing has now made it possible to not only measure the various frequencies represented in the so-called brain waves, but also to obtain information about their most likely points of origin as well as the functional interconnections in the brain. There are now several derivations of EEG. The basic EEG just looks at wave patterns. BEAM or QEEG looks at the distribution and absolute or relative power of different wave frequencies and how they synchronize across the brain. Low resolution electrotomography or Loretta produces 3D maps of the origin of electrical signals and event-related potentials or ERPs evaluates the direction, speed and resistance to electrical wave transmissions across brain regions. Here's a good example of how neuroimaging has started to revolutionize our understanding of dissociative disorders or raise additional questions. This is a German study involving an individual who suffered from cortical blindness for 15 years which means in simplistic terms that the eyes weren't blind, but the brain was, 
and who, during psychotherapy for dissociative identity disorder, regained vision incrementally during personality switches until he was fully recovered upon integration. What is most extraordinary about the study is that the electrophysiological measurements conducted before and after integration verified that the individual's brain truly and objectively did not process visual signals when operating as one of the personalities, but could do so in the case of others. To use the analogy of the piano again, it was as though there were more than one pianist, and some of them were able to make use of a certain section of the keyboard, in this case the expression of vision, whilst others were not. It was as though upon integration the full keyboard was again available. One of the consistent features related to the development of dissociative disorders is the association with early childhood relational trauma. It's not unusual for individuals in the process of counselling or psychotherapy to describe distress or memories associated with very early childhood, sometimes even within the womb. Given the relatively primitive stage of development and myelination of the brain at the time of birth, there has been a certain incredulity about the validity of such memories. But studies such as these, showing the impact of voice on emotional processing in the neonate, offer surprising evidence of the potential impact of relational trauma, even at this early stage. Simple expressions, such as the syllables dada, when spoken in neutral, happy or fearful patterns of rhythm and sound, produced starkly contrasting electrophysiological signatures in event-related potentials in a one-month-old baby. One of the areas of historical controversy in mental illness has been the association or connotation with spiritual or demonic entities or some form of human psychic residue. Without attempting to prove the validity of any extraneous non-material influence upon the human psyche, this recent study was able to show, using psychometric and brain electrophysiological data, that there is a distinctly different mental electrophysiological pattern when individuals who were alleged to be mediums, were respectively either thinking of a known living person, listening to a biography, thinking about an imaginary person, and actively interacting mentally with a known deceased individual. The study concluded that the differences in psychometric and electrophysiological data in the process of communicating with the deceased represented a mental state that was distinctly different from ordinary thinking or imagination. Although this does not answer the question of whether certain forms of mental illness could be attributed to extraneous influences, it does show that the mental processes of engaging with a previously living individual is a distinctly different and valid neurophysiological phenomenon. Some of the following slides relate to magnetic resonance imaging. So, by way of quick overview, MRI exploits the unique behavior of hydrogen atoms within a strong magnetic field. In the process of aligning and disaligning to the surrounding magnetic field, radio signals are emitted from which images can be generated. Different protocols, largely related to the timing of magnetic field changes and filtering of the associated signals, make this imaging technique very versatile and able to capture both structural and functional features. Most MRI techniques in use today are able to perform the structural tests. Larger magnets and more sophisticated processing is needed for functional MRI, diffusion tensor imaging and MRI spectroscopy. This is an example of how a functional MRI examination was used to test the theory that patients with dissociative identity disorders compartmentalize their traumatic memories as emotional parts, but mentally avoid these as so-called apparently normal parts of the personality. This is called the theory of structural dissociation of the personality. The purpose of the study was to determine specifically whether the so-called ANP, or apparently normal part, and EP, or emotional part, had different biopsychosocial reactions to the presentation of angry and neutral faces compared to actors who were instructed and motivated to simulate normal and emotional responses. Compared to the so-called normal controls, DID patients had far more activation in the brainstem, face-sensitive regions, and motor-related areas. 
Essentially, as emotional parts, they were overactivated, and as normal persons, they were underactivated. These findings support the theory of structural dissociation of the personality and provide further empirical support for the validity of DID. Here's a study that looked at the activity, or lack of activity, in the brain during a voluntary out-of-body experience. Without being too technical, the areas of the brain responsible for visual processing, in a sense, went offline as the individual being studied initiated the out-of-body experience. Getting back to the piano analogy, the keys responsible for visual processing stopped moving. But their music kept playing in such a way that it was still accessible to the consciousness of the subject, but not to the fMRI scanner. There were other areas of the brain that were more active, but these were not associated with visual signal processing, but rather with action monitoring. So these studies are now starting to tease apart some of the hardware and software aspects of the human mind. Importantly, these findings do not deny physical realities, but neither do they exclude psychological or spiritual phenomena. If one were to summarize what the literature has shown in dissociative disorders as it relates to neuroimaging, it would be as follows. The orbitofrontal, which is above the eyes, corticolimbic, which is the surface of the brain as well as the emotional parts, and temporal areas of the brain show definite abnormalities in dissociative identity disorder, with different neurobiological profiles found across identities rather than those doing simulations. Cognitive functioning, in other words thinking, while varying across identities, appears to support the bias in threat detection and management. In other words, it appears that an individual in different mental states processes perceived threats and the management of the threat in different ways. Reported amnesia between identities may be produced by so-called metacognitive processes, in other words, thinking above thinking, but studies are yet to assess the transfer of such autobiographical episodic memories for traumatic events. In other words, the scan cannot give you a complete life review, only which parts of the brain are active at a given time point.